now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this update from our Afghan refugee response team. Can you hear me now? The refugee response ministry was formed about five years, almost five years ago now, in response to what then was a refugee crisis that St. Columbus desired to play some role in helping to address. And as you, we all know from just watching the world in the intervening years, it's only gotten tragically worse at that time. I think there are, the UN estimates there are over 80 million people in the world who are displaced from their homes because of violence, persecution, war, and other, other factors. And of that group, 25 million are, are defined as refugees for the UN's purposes. And these numbers can just seem overwhelming. Um, but the, the good news we have to bring today is that we continue to learn in this ministry that bad news never has the last word in God's world. And um, hearing the gospel today, Jesus three times reminding us, if you love me, feed my sheep. Three times Peter gets the, the, this admonition. And often when I think about the phrase, feed my sheep, it occurs to me, I'm going to go take God's love, spend it through me to reach out to a person who's disconnected from community somehow and needs to be brought back but that the doing is on my part, and that the, the feeding is something that our community is doing. And all of us that get involved in outreach and justice work here at St. Columbus, at one point or another, discover that the feeding goes both ways, that we, in, in doing this work, are greatly fed. And so that's what this morning's conversation is about, just to bring us up to date, not only on what we are, giving forth in terms of services to the Afghan families that we've, we've, with whom we've, we've joined in as companions, uh, but also the ways in which this activity is lifting us in hope and knowledge of God and, and, and love for one another. So I have a prayer to get us started, and then I'm going to turn the meeting over to our intrepid chair, Carrie Peister. Uh, can we pray together? Gracious God, you have given all peoples one common origin, and it is your will that we be gathered together as one family in you. Watch over all those who flee from violence and injustice. All who see home and all it means disappear behind them, and those who cannot see a home in the days ahead of them. Continue to stir us to reach out as bearers of your love, and to discover the new beginnings that are possible for all of us when we recognize that our true home is in you. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, David. Salam Allah Peace be upon you. That's what we learned. I'm going to say it one more time. Salam alaikum. Peace be upon you. As all of these people know, these members of our refugee response ministry team, um, that's how Afghans greet one another and um, how we greeted them. But we've also learned that they are already adopting our customs. So if they put out their hand, please do shake it if you feel comfortable. Um, I know coming out of COVID, not everybody's doing that yet, but they're putting their hands right out to greet us. So, um, but we're also trying to um, be respectful of their traditions and really welcoming, welcoming them in the um, most um, sensitive and generous ways. Uh, as David said, I'm Carrie Peister. I um, am the chair of the Refugee Response Ministry and I have the privilege to lead a leadership team of 13 individuals. Some are here today to speak with us about their experiences and ways you all can get involved. Um, I am not an expert on the Afghan crisis. I'm not an expert on the refugee crisis. 
Um, what I'm here to share with you today is how St. Columbus is responding to this crisis. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update and then I'm going to let these um, members of the ministry team introduce themselves and tell you ways that they've been working with the families we're sponsoring. And really, um, looks like the pictures aren't working right now. We'll, we'll get that back online. Um, but the pictures really do tell a good part of the story. Um, we, about a month ago, um, began, uh, welcomed the Kahani family. They're a family of three. Uh, Maladad, Najiba, and their two, three-year-old son, Salomon. And we are thankful to a congregant at Temple Sinai. Um, they have provided a rent-free apartment, and that enabled us as a team to basically say, let's sponsor a second family. And so in partnership with ECDC, ECDC is um, one of the refugee resettlement agencies, the Ethiopian um, Community Development Council, and about two weeks ago, we welcomed the Baseri family. And they're a family of four, Abdul, Diwa, and their two girls, Hassanat and Omra, six years old and four years old. And now you're gonna hear the great news. These people and the rest of the team decided this week that we would really respond to your generosity because you helped us raise a good portion of money back in February with the 2022 um, annual outreach deal. And you said to us, do the greatest good for the greatest number. We're sponsoring a third family. And so that has been, thank you, thank you, yes, yes. So um, we are going to be sponsoring the Amini family. They're also a family of four. Uh, Baktash, uh, Mariam, and they have two children, a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Baktash and Abdul are colleagues from Voice of America in Afghanistan. And they've been supporting each other. And when we became aware of Baktash's story, we said, we have to do this. And so, um, and, and, and Gardell and the financial people said we could. So, so uh, anyway, uh, so that's great news. And I'm going to say one more thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to this team. And what I'm going to say is what you usually say at the end, and we often run out of time for, which is when you exit, there's a welcome banner for the bus three family. Please sign it. That's one way we can all welcome them. They love that banner. The first family still has it up. I told them they could take it down. They still have it up. The other way you can help us is by signing up for one of the activities and again, some of these are one-time volunteer opportunities. The most important one is next Saturday, May 6th, we are moving in the Amini family to an apartment in the same apartment complex as the Baseri family because God makes miracles happen and we got a second apartment in the same apartment complex. So we're so excited about that. And. Um, uh, you can sign up for an activity, and if you're watching um, live, remote, you can go to our St. Columbus website, go to um, the top, click on Take Action, look for Refugee Response Ministry, and you'll find information there, or email refugee.response at columba.org. Okay, and now I'm going to um, have each member of the team that's here. Before I do that, I want to I want to recognize one person. Anne Romick, would you stand, please? Anne Romick is not in the pictures, but she's our communication chair. She's the one that's been sending all those wonderful messages and pictures in the E News. She's done an incredible job working with the communication staff. And she's one of those behind the scenes essential people we really need. And so thank you, Anne. I'm gonna turn it over now to Gardell. 
Thank you, Carrie. Um, by the way, if Carrie ever wants to do something and you're in her way, I suggest you move out of the way because it's going to happen whether you want it to happen or not. So thank you very much for your continued leadership, Carrie. I'm Gardell. I work the Finance Committee for the Refugee Response. Um, been on that role for five years. Um, we're supposed to tell an endearing story, and mine is more how the, these, this experience has really reframed how I view what it means to help people. So at St. Columbus, we have our water ministry, and I just did rebuilding yesterday, and both of those are really um, more triage, more someone is in need, immediate need, kind of going to the emergency room. You're there, you prop them up, you know, maybe just for that day, good clean clothes or better outlets in their house. With refugee, you see a different story, a little bit of the Samaritan, the story of the Samaritan being helped. You have someone who's down, not through any fault of their own. They've had to move, make this jarring transition. And I came into it really thinking, oh, they're gonna need you know, so much help. But in fact, they're more like someone with a, a broken toe or a broken ankle. They just need a little bit of help at the beginning and then really you can open your hands and they will just take off. And it, it just help remind you of not everything has to be fixed by you. In my role as finance committee, our chair, I A, convinced the vestry that yes, we can, through, through your generosity, as Carrie pointed out, we can support these families. So that's one half of it. The other is kind of introducing these families to the American financial system. Well, that really takes the, the barest minimum of effort because A, they know how to save a buck. You know, they grew up in tough circumstances. They've been living in tough circumstances. And so you're not worried about them wasting their, their resources. Also, they're very tight knit. Once they find other people in similar situations, they rapidly tap into sort of a spider web of connections and other things. And that has really opened my eyes don't have to hold them like a little baby. You really are just getting them going on that tricycle that, that first time, and then now they can ride the bike themselves and go on to have a much, uh, you, you can see that the, just the joy, the transition in them. They get their uh, place to live that's you know, semi-permanent. They're getting help from all these great people, and now they can really start, start to fly. And I think we've now created sort of a, our own little Afghani support group network, you know, through our natural connections. And you see that importance. Once you have some kind of community, we're kind of an exterior community to tap into greater resources, but then we've created this really more intimate community that allows them to really fly and take off. So it is very exciting. I, they're super, uh, what do I want to say, hospitable at every opportunity, and it just really lights you up when you get a chance to interact with the families or even help peripherally on the side. That's kind of all I have here. Shelly, she's really doing the work. Hi, everybody. I'm Shelly Geshen, and I serve on two committees. I co-chair the Health and Benefits Committee with Margie Trinity, who isn't here today. Um, and then I also am the major aide-de-camp to Ellis Goodman, who is doing employment. My story is that on Thursday, Margie and I went to see the Basery family to see what their health needs are. A lot of times people come and they need all kinds of stuff. They haven't been able to get their needs met for months. And these folks seem okay, but there's a bunch of things they actually need. So we had a few minutes with all of them. Abdul had to, was late and then he had to leave again to go pick up his daughter. When I was done, I, I was walking out and I saw Abdul and the older daughter, Hassanet, coming from afar. So I put my stuff in my car and walked towards them. And I realized that Hassanet was skipping all the way. She is six or seven, I think. And, you know, we, we, I've never seen two such joyful people. They were radiating joy. And I said, did you? It was her first day of school. It's been months since those children were in school. And she was just so happy. 
And I said, so also Abdul got his checks. He got money from the relief agency that the State Department has for each refugee family. So I said, great day. You got your checks. And, and Hassan and went to school and he said, the checks, they are good, but that's nothing compared to this. Nothing. And, and, I had, and it just brought tears to my eyes. This is a man with a professional wife who taught at the university and would have lost her job had she stayed because they don't let women work. And a, a, a father of two bright girls who would have been a cat. They would have only been able to go to school through primary school. And then they would have been kept at home until they were married. So that's a very big deal. And it's, it, we didn't bring them here. Voice of America brought them here. The United States government brought them here. But we can wrap our arms around them and make sure that they have a great start. They, they're very resourceful, they're very wonderful people, and we're learning as much from them as, as they are from us. So, and, and why, uh, Carrie asked us to say why we think it, it would be, you know, what, what's in it for anyone who seeks to volunteer for this ministry. And what I would say is that it's really rewarding. It's, I'm a pragmatic person, and I love the phrase, live God's love, but it sort of just seems like an abstract and lovely notion. And then you do something like this, and you think, oh, this is what it means. You, this, you help them get jobs, and you help them get prenatal care, and you bring food to them. This is living God's love. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Hirsch, um, and I'm the chair of the Housing and Furnishings Committee. Um, and I think, first and foremost, the, the generosity of this community has been profound. I mean, we've, we've uh, as Carrie and Gardell noted, we had incredible financial donations. We also had incredible donations in terms of furnishings and household goods. And that has been what has enabled us to take on uh, and to sponsor this third family. But I think, um, so, so a big thank you to everyone for that. Um, I think the memory that most stands out at this stage is you know, on the, the Housing and Furnishings Committee, we've been going around, uh, various folks have either uh, learned how to drive U-Haul trucks or, uh, and carry, <laughs> um, or lent pickup trucks, and so we've been going all around the city picking up furnishings and various household goods and filling storage units and, um, and then doing home setups and whatnot. But um, what then stands out is that moment when you get to see the family walk into their new home after having spent so many months um, in a hotel and or on a base. And so last Sunday, I guess it was, um, Carrie and I moved in uh, the Basari family. And we, the, the house, the, the apartment had already been set up, but we got to bring them from the hotel to their uh, new apartment. Um, and actually the Quaja family came and helped us in terms of the move in. But watching the little girls as they entered that apartment and um, saw this table of books that we had for them that had been donated and just the, the just joy and excitement um, on their faces was, was definitely a memory that will, will always um, stand out. Um, and the other piece of that is just how much of a community um, they already have here, both with this, this congregation but also with um, the Quaja family and uh, with the voice of, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, the third family, the Amina family, excuse me. Um, they've, they've already started to um, build significant roots here and we sat around with them for a good 30 minutes or so listening to um, the Quaja family already talking about, you know, where to apply for jobs and how to write, you know, this and that on a resume and, and already starting to kind of give tips for for jumping in, um, and it was just really amazing. And I know Shelly has been kind of leading the charge and helping them um, with the application process, but it's just been an incredible process to see. So anyone who's interested, um, definitely encourage you to, to join us. Good morning, my name is Catherine Bruno, and I am the chair of the Welcome Committee. And the wonderful thing about being the chair of the Welcome Committee is that um, the welcome isn't just one day or one, one week or one month. We can continue to welcome these families um, throughout the entire ministry. And um, I got started uh, last time with the Kawaja family. And uh, 
as a result of that, even months after they arrived, I was able to uh, inter help them learn about some, some holidays we have. Halloween was of great interest to the children. Uh, the notion that they could go up to someone's door and ring the bell and get a piece of candy. And um, the little one actually just sat down right where he was and just ate it right there. And he thought, <laughs> he was he to do it every house. It took us a while to <laughs> get him there. But, uh, so it's been a wonderful way to participate. And uh, one of the things about it that's been fantastic is that uh, I found as a, a mom uh, with pretty young kids that volunteering is somewhat limited. You can make the sandwiches um, here at church and there's things like that, but you really aren't, most places where you would go to volunteer, you can't bring smaller children. If they have to be at least 13. So with this ministry, I've been able to involve my children completely. Uh, they can do a welcome as much as anyone of any age and uh, it gives them an opportunity to see um, families in other circumstances, which has been really wonderful for my kids to learn about Afghanistan, to learn about other circumstances. And um, so, for example, um, we uh, have had the, um, uh, the Najiba and Maladad and Suleiman over to dinner. Um, recently, uh, I, I learned that um, they didn't know where one of the good parks was near their house. So we walked from their house to the park so they could make sure they knew how to walk there themselves. And then when Suleiman saw a squirrel, I mean, he was just fascinated. I guess they don't have squirrels in Kabul. So um, it's just wonderful to see a young person just discovering new things. Uh, and I'm always reminded of um, the wonderful Mr. Rogers and how in difficult times he said to children dealing with trauma, he said, you know, look for the helpers. And this is our chance to be the helpers and to let our children be helpers too. So it's just a wonderful opportunity and it's been a, a real blessing. And I thank Carrie and Gardell and um, Reverend Griswold and everyone for their, um, for their uh, putting this together because I wouldn't be able to participate and the generosity of all of you. I've, I've also asked them to share just like a, a sentence or two about why they'd encourage all of you to do this work with us. Um, even, um, uh, you know, come to a home setup or invite someone um, to celebrate uh, a holiday. We have Fourth of July coming up, invite one of the families or to go to your favorite museum. Um, there's a host of things you can be involved in. They're listed out on the tables outside. <laughs> um, but I guess from my own from my own perspective, and there's many reasons I would encourage you, but one of them I would say is friendship and fellowship. The people I know in this parish, the people here are now my friends. I, some of them I didn't know before. And we break bread together, we, we discuss difficult situations and try to work through them, we support one another, but there is fellowship among us and it strengthens us as a community. So that's one reason why I would encourage you. Just add to that that there, the experience will stretch you and delight you in ways you have no way of anticipating before you. And this was true for me on, on the day we met the family at the airport and came back and in the afternoon we went, we went to uh, the mobile store because Carrie was helping them purchase a cell phone, a very important step in, in, in the process, obviously. But Suleiman, two years old, could not sit still, could not wait this long process of, of his parents getting a cell phone. So my role began, became babysit this two-year-old. Um, and an hour seems like a very long time <laughs> when, when you have no experience with children. <laughs> and when I interviewed to the deacon here, Ledley never said to me that your job one day will include uh, babysitting a two-year-old. But I grew, I grew in such a wonderful, such a wonderful way. And, um, and we, we found a rapport that I didn't understand was in my toolkit for relationships. So you never know. Yeah, I would say also what's great is that um, we need a variety of people with a variety of different circumstances who will recognize um, 
and be creative about what, uh, what the family could use and what would benefit them. So um, I really think a diversity of experiences um, and knowledge is the best way to help these families. Um, I recognized um, that uh, Najiba, it seemed like she hadn't been out much. And I said, well, have you taken the bus yet? And she said, no, she hadn't taken the bus yet. So I thought, well, that's something I can do. Like, I definitely know how to take the bus. So um, we, we uh, left her house, walked to the bus stop, you know, figured out which car goes, you know, we did the whole thing. We went to the zoo and back. It was a simple trip, but um, it was an opportunity. I, you know, I didn't know that teaching someone to ride the bus would be what would be needed from me that particular day. But everyone in the parish has skills, and we really need people to just be there and notice, um, spend time with them and say, oh, you know what, I think this would be what would be helpful to this family in the near future. And, and, and to bring that diversity of, of knowledge would be very, very helpful to us. Um, I think one thing to note is this is um, a long-term commitment that we've made. So, you know, right now we're in the midst of moving in and settling and welcoming, but this is ongoing. We are in it um, for the long haul. We've, we've told um, them, you know, that, that this is a year commitment. So if right now isn't the moment that you're able to, uh, to give back and volunteer, um, but, you know, six months down the line is that time, Again, like please just keep this in mind as opportunities arise, as events and holidays arise, as, as you think of, of what brings you joy in this city, in this country, and, and you think, I'd like to share that. Um, this is something that um, we are, a partnership that we have with these families for a long time. So um, just keep that in mind as, as the year progresses as well. So I have a, <clears throat> I agree with everything that everybody said, but I, I want, I have one word for you, food. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if these are more endearing stories or more reasons to get involved, but not long after uh, Carrie and the team settled uh, the Connies, our first family in their apartment, I got an email from Aladad saying, can you please invite Miss Carrie and Miss Alice and, and he listed this bunch of names tomorrow for dinner at our house. And I thought, I can't go to dinner tomorrow at the house. And Carrie had a funeral, and there's work, and there's soccer, and whatever else. And, but anyway, the, the, I did end up going, and uh, Jim and Judy Klein went too. And you, and, and what they, they had a very, um, I guess it's a traditional dish. It's called Ashoka or something like that. And basically, she spent all day and made these really delicious dumplings that had this sort of green, special greens in them. And then there was a, a sauce, and then this thinner yogurt thing it was this beautiful plate that they gave us. It was a really unique experience, and they're full of laughter and joy. And you think, my God, if I had been through all that they've been through, would I ever? be able to do that. But the dignity for them in being able to return the favor, and we have shown them hospitality, they are showing us hospitality back. That was very meaningful to them. And then the first time I went to meet the, the Basery family, I was working with Abdul on jobs and finishing his resume, and we started putting in applications. Um, so, you know, this is Ramadan, so they're not eating anything from 4 o'clock in the morning through 7.30 at night, not even water. But they had cookies for me, and they had water and tea for me when I came. They gave me a mug of cardamom tea, and she had made these special cookies called elephant ear, which had a long name, but it basically translates to elephant ear. They're fried, and they have a tiny bit of sugar and finely chopped um, pistachios and a little bit of cardamom on top, and they were absolutely delicious, and I ate two. <laughs> and I had cardamom tea, which I did not need. I was up half the night. <laughs> but it was worth it. They, they're extremely hospitable people, and I just, I feel like it's not all giving. It's giving and receiving. It's, it's these could be my children and my grandchildren. They're just about the same age, and I, I would do, I want to do as much for them as I would for my own family, and I think they're going to do stuff for us. Family number one, the Kawajas, Friday took us to the airport when we went to Denver for my, recently for uh, a meeting for my husband, and he wouldn't let us pay him. 
he's, uh, he's paying it forward. We helped him, and now he's paying it forward and helping these, these new families. He's our, our character reference. He says, they're not crazy, you can trust them. <laughs> but anyway, another way, a reason to volunteer, food. We were having a somewhat lengthy uh, Zoom call the other day trying to figure out if we could support three, three families. And we all were like, it was like a military campaign. We could welcome them, we got the money, we got furniture donations, we got people lined up. Blah, blah, blah. They're going to get jobs because they can speak English. So we had all these very rational reasons why this was possible. And then Cami sort of raised her hand and said, you know, let's, let's remember this is about the gospel and about welcome and love. And, and that oftentimes I feel in St. Columbus, I only, I feel closest to God when I work with the congregation. In this case, working with people not from our congregation, but who are in need and, and in help. So that's my note of it, is that this is a way to do, you can be involved for a very little amount of time or a lengthy amount of time. We'll get tired eventually, right? Everyone's rah, rah, rah at the beginning. But as someone said, you know, we're in this for a year possibly, and let's, we'll, we'll need help. So it helps us to know that other people are there to, to backstop us. Are there any questions? How can the clergy get involved in, in this, uh, in this? We have a whole time, the clergy are very important. So David is a, David is a member of the clergy and um, Reverend Curtis. Testing. And uh, he has been involved since the beginning in terms of helping us discern what to do in response initially to the crisis. And we did some other activities in the fall, as you're all aware of. And he leads us often in prayer, which is really um, something that I think we all value and, and kind of grounds us in that and, and reminds us that um, this is what is inspiring this work. And, um, and also is just present with the families. And um, the other members of the clergy and the staff have been incredibly supportive. And, and our bishop has a task force. David and I sit on the task force. So we're very aware of what other congregations are doing. We've been supported by other congregations. I mean, it's incredible that a, that a Jewish synagogue and a Christian church are supporting Muslims in, in this community. I mean, it really, really is powerful that we've come together in that way. Um, and uh, they were the ones that, you know, in, connected us with the second family. And when they heard there was a possibility, the third family said, how can we help? And so we're in partnership. And, and David's also reached out to um, uh, a, a local um, Ukraine, the, the cathedral, and so we're, we are keeping that in mind long term, what we might be able to do. So there's a lot of interaction, right? David, do you want to say another word on that? Are there more questions? Thank you for sharing everything you've been doing. It's wonderful to hear. I, I did come in late, but I was wondering if um, the Afghan families are connecting with each other because of the culture shock and the dramatic changes. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't share an endearing story, but here goes. There are many. But as you all know, in 2017, we welcomed and sponsored the Kwaja family. They've been here now five years. Um, they refer to us, and they tell other people we're their family here. And that to me is very endearing, to be referred to as someone's family. Um, when we were preparing this work, we went, myself, Jim and Judy Klein, who are the chairs of um, food and clothing support, the Quajas took us to the Afghan market and showed us the things that Afghans like. 
introduced us to many people there. And then when the families that were now sponsors started coming, they've met every one of them. And they give them their telephone numbers and they've, they've been there helping do that work. And the families are gonna start interacting. Um, we've been giving them some time to literally settle in and one of them we still have to move. But I think they will support one another. And just one thing, when the first family was have, struggling to set up their cable, as my husband can attest to, I'm a little bit technologically challenged. So I got Sadiq Kwaja, the oldest Kwaja son on the phone. I said, can you come over? He races over, and this is what he says when he arrives to the family. Because he just arrived, and I said, I didn't recognize you because you're in a new car. He goes to them, I've been here five years. I have my dream job and my dream car. He goes, it can happen for you. These people are going to support you. We're going to support you. You're going to be OK. So yes. Any other questions? So, the, um, one of the fabulous uh, chairs that serves with us um, has been back and forth with the family quite a bit, and um, she shared a story with us during our meeting Thursday night that. Um, they reached out to her and she answered the phone and said she was she was quite sick, food poisoning or something, and couldn't um, come over that day to help them and lay back down and said she was down for the count. And a few hours later, her husband comes in with a loaf of fresh baked bread and said um, that uh, one of the that the Connie family uh, had come over with fresh bread, hearing that she was sick. Um, and brought it to her to help uh, her feel better. And it's just, I think it just demonstrates really the, the incredible reciprocity um, that we have with these families. I mean, we, again, we are doing everything we can to give, but they are so committed to um, giving back to us and are just genuinely care um, about building a, a real relationship here. And there's just, there's so much power in all of that. Okay, so this isn't an endearing story, but I have a plea. And that is that um, if you have resources of any sort, like you know of someone who has maternity clothes that the Jeepa could use, or if you know people who are hiring and you're not sure if it might be a good fit for one of these families, please feel free to get in touch with any of us. Um, the the Kawaja family five years ago had um, a different level of education, a lower level than any of the families that we have coming now. Um, these are all educated people. They have, they have pretty advanced English skills, some of them. Um, the the uh, Abdul uh, Basri has a master's degree. He speaks four languages and he has 13 years of experience in IT. I mean, and yet, we still have to find him a job. It sounds like that would be really easy, but it's not. And, um, so anyway, there are many ways in which people can help in little ways if you're interested. So don't hesitate to get in touch if there's something like a new rug. They love rugs. All of them want rugs all over their apartments. <laughs> oh, just let us know, and maybe we can use it to help the, these wonderful people. I also wanted to um, add that with Ramadan coming to an end and the families, all three, well, two moved in, one's going to move in this coming Saturday, and certainly you're welcome to sign up to help. And there's all kinds of ways you can help out of move in. Like, you may not be able to move in furniture, but um, Elsa Skaggs just stepped out. She did an amazing job just unpacking the kitchen. She just was just so joyful in setting up their kitchen and they loved that. Um, so there's many ways people can help with a move-in, but th there's just, just simple ways that can happen. And I think you're gonna be hearing more communication from us and via the e-news about activities that we're planning. Because during Ramadan, as someone else already mentioned, they've been fasting and they've asked us to wait because they really can't join us in a meal. 
So the first family came right before Ramadan. We had a great welcome meal at um, Catherine's home, and that was it. <laughs> so there are going to be things coming in May. We're hoping to have something out on the playground. We can't invite everyone. So we, we, but we try to invite um, people who express to us an interest, who want to be there to help in certain ways. And we're going to try to have multiple activities. We're thinking of a soccer outing at some point. And then there's the small one-on-one -on -one ways. Um, and you may think of something we haven't. Catherine was the brilliant person last time who said, I think they need library cards and took them you know, to the local library to get library cards. So there are many ways, and we kind of, some of us are up here in the big picture of like jobs and benefits, but it's so important and very important to them to, to experience life here. So, does anybody else have anything? Well, thank you all for being with us here today. And, Please keep coming and accompanying us in this work. Thank you.